Father, we've come into your presence this morning and what a joy it is. We are your precious sons and daughters and we are able to call you our Father. We thank you that even before creation you had that plan as we've already sung to bring all things together in Christ. And we thank you for what you have done through your precious son that has enabled us to come into relationship with you. We were able to stand and we are able to sing good, good Father. So we give you thanks. We come humbly into your presence this morning to honor you And to give you glory. But we're also grateful for the love that you offer each one of us. For the grace that you extend to us. For the fellowship. For the opportunity to grow in your likeness. And so as we come together this morning. May we come humbly. And may we be open to the work of your spirit in us. Changing us and growing us. That we may become more like you. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Even in the times when we are unable to feel your presence with us or see you at work, we know that your character means that you are faithful and that you are indeed present and at work. And so we remember. We remember the times that you have been faithful in our past. And we give you praise and glory And remember those times that enabled us to stand strong in our present and look forward in hope to what lies ahead. Father, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. As we open your word this morning, may you open our eyes to see you afresh. May you encourage us. May you warm our hearts. May your spirit change us. For your glory and in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Kia ora kato. Good morning. Uh, welcome. And uh, welcome to those who are uh, joining us online as well, um, either watching now or at some point uh, later in the, in the, um, in the time. Um, I bring you greetings this morning from our Northern Baptist churches. Um, We have uh, been working, um, joining together over the past couple of days uh, with our hui, as Janet has already mentioned, and we are representative of a hundred churches from Doubtless Bay, Kaitaia in the north, right down to uh, Franklin Baptist in the south, about a hundred churches, and um, so we bring greetings uh, to you this morning from a range of our Baptist family, and it's been great to join with many of the leaders over this uh, past couple of days at Tikipunga Baptist, to uh, really, I guess, to, to focus on who God is and the renewal that he's able to bring. It's been a, a really difficult time, as we're aware, with the impact of COVID on us for the last two and a half years. Uh, there are many leaders and pastors that are quite drained and uh, are feeling uh, burdened with the, the call of leadership over that time, with all the change that's gone on and um, how they have had to respond. And so to come together uh, for the space where we can spend time together, where we can encourage one another, pray for one another, uh, allow God's Spirit to bring that renewal has been an encouraging time. And um, we're grateful uh, for the teams that have contributed to make that possible for us. Um, As Janet has already mentioned, Cheryl and her team, uh, we are grateful for the dinner that you provided on Friday night, so thank you. Um, and thank you for the uh, Whangarei Central for hosting us here in your in your hall. Uh, we had a fantastic evening together over over dinner, and um, we're grateful for Kamo Baptist and Whangarei Bat- um, sorry Tikipunga Baptist for for hosting as well. As we focus on that renewal, some of the renewal that needs to happen um, is the change that is going on in our world and how our church needs to come to an understanding of who we are as the people of God today. And so that renewal needs to happen within us as individuals, uh, but also as church communities. And this morning, I um, bring you a message from Nehemiah that I hope will help us on that journey. I want to start with a a story. Uh, Some of you will be familiar with it, but a story that will lead us uh, into our message this morning. And the story is told of a, a traveler in the Middle Ages who had been exploring alone. And when he came across a village that 
uh, with the, where there was a large work site. He was eager to find people to speak to. He'd been traveling alone and was looking for some conversation. So the traveler walked up to one of the workers at the site and asked him what he was doing. The worker frowned and replied somewhat tersely, I'm cutting stones. The traveler decided he wasn't going to find any conversation there, and so he moved on to find another worker. When he asked the same question, the worker paused for a moment and explained that he was cutting stones so that he could support his family. It was pretty obvious he wanted to get back to work as well. So the traveler moved to a third worker and asked the same question. May I ask what you're doing? The worker put down his tools, stood quite tall, looked the traveler in the eyes and gave him a warm smile and replied, I'm building a cathedral. It will be one of the tallest and most magnificent structures around. Its beauty will delight people for centuries to come. The stone I'm now working on will go near the front door where people will enter for shelter and community. I'll probably never see the end result, but I know my part has contributed to something significant. Each worker was doing the same job, but they all had a very different vision of what they were doing and what they were contributing to. And this morning, I'd like to invite you to lift your eyes to embrace a larger vision of what it means for us to be the church today, to be the people of God who know their identity as his sons and daughters, as people who are able to sing songs about a good, good father and know what he's calling us to be and to do in our 21st century context. And to help us on that journey, we're going to go back to 444 BC. We're going to look at the story of Nehemiah. 444 BC was a time when some of God's people have returned from Babylonian exile to Jerusalem. Years before, Nebuchadnezzar besieged the city of Jerusalem and, and he took many of the Jews back into Babylon, where they continued to live in exile. So we're joining the story at a point where some have returned. But Nehemiah himself remained in exile as a cupbearer to the king of Persia. It's here Nehemiah received news from Jerusalem. The walls of the city have been destroyed. The city lay in ruins. And those who had returned from exile, they weren't living God's ways. You can imagine someone like Nehemiah how devastating that news was. His hopes shattered. His heart was broken. But he responded by turning to God in fasting and prayer, as we've heard from Rob this morning, and spent time waiting on God. And through this process of waiting, God was doing a work of preparation in Nehemiah. Four months Four months went by and then the moment came when Nehemiah was provided with this opportunity to advance the call of God. The call that had been forming in him through that period of waiting. And in the presence of the king of Persia, Nehemiah summed up the courage and he asked the king for permission to go to Jerusalem. And in doing so, he was being obedient to God's call to go and rebuild the city. Back in Jerusalem, Nehemiah realized that God's call to rebuild the walls wasn't something he himself could bring about. You know, when a, a task is too big and you go to your next door neighbor and you knock on the door and you say, would you mind giving me a hand for a moment? It was a bit like that. Except this task was so much bigger that it involved everyone. Everyone needed to be involved in order to rebuild the wall. And so Nehemiah went about getting people to join in and to participate. It takes us all to be part of God's story, to join him in bringing all things together in Christ, to join him in being the people of God. We're better together. And that brings us to chapter 4. 
where I'd like to focus us today. We see opposition to the work of rebuilding the walls begins to raise its ugly head. God's ways are not the ways of the world. And when we're being obedient to God's call and joining in his work, opposition and conflict will inevitably follow. We see in verse 2, Sembalat the Horonite begins to ridicule the Jews. What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? And others join in with the ridicule and the insults. Despite all the opposition, Nehemiah and the people never wavered. They continued to focus on the work with all their heart, rebuilding the wall till it reached half its height all the way around the city. That was no mean feat. And then we see that they reach a critical time. This time in between when God had opened up the vision before Nehemiah and called him back to Jerusalem. And, the, and when it starts to unfold and its final fulfillment. This liminal space, this time in between what was and what is to come. This pivotal time in the middle when it becomes tempting to give up, to become discouraged, to lose sight of the goal, or at least feel like the goal is beyond reach. That's what starts to happen with the rebuilding of the wall. The constant ridicule, the negative messages, the threats that even came to their lives. All that external opposition starts to move inward. And it starts to weigh heavily upon them. Generating fear and anxiety. Robbing them of hope. And we see the effects in verse 10. The strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. The internal emotions and thoughts start to create doubt. It's a bit like Peter walking on the water, moving towards Jesus until he saw the wind. And maybe we're feeling a bit demoralized as we feel the weight of our experiences today. Processing the impact of immense change happening around us. Or the impact of COVID. Maybe for those who have experienced it physically. It's been draining. It's it's left you tired. But maybe it's been mentally through the the numerous lockdowns that we've experienced in Northland and, and in Auckland. Perhaps you've had your lives impacted financially. Even grieving the lost part of grieving what we've lost in the past. As COVID has taken its toll. We've perhaps lost sight of the forest for the trees. We may have been excited about what God had laid on our heart, how we were responding to his call on our lives. And we've encountered opposition along the way. Even the relational difficulties amongst the church family that we carry. And perhaps, like the laborers, the internal messages start to play again. I can't do this. Look at the rubble. There's no way that that can be brought to life. There's no hope for change. And you might feel like giving up. Perhaps some of you have even considered walking away from your faith or from the church community. To be living a life with God's vision before us today is difficult. The context the church finds itself in in the Western world is difficult. More towards the fringes than where it has historically been towards its center. And with that becomes a sense of alienation and displacement, indifference and despair. 
And it all starts to weigh heavily upon us as God's people, as God's church. Opposition will come as we share in the life of God and live according to his ways. And our response as individuals and as a church in these times is important. This time in between what has been for the church and what is emerging. A time in between God's call and its final fulfillment when Jesus returns and ushers in the new heaven and new earth. So how are we to respond? Rather than being overwhelmed with burden and anxiety. Let's see what we can learn from Nehemiah's response. Nehemiah is a a gifted leader. And in the midst of this situation where his people are losing heart, he stands up and exhibits his leadership. But it's different to how our leadership in our world functions. After putting in place practical measures to prevent his people against physical attack, Nehemiah says this in verse 14. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. That's the antagonists. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers and sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. And in this response, we firstly see God, uh, Nehemiah reminding the people of God. God was the one that was leading them. He was the one that had called them. And in reminding the people of God, Nehemiah invited them to recall their past experience of God, of, of God. Remember, he said to the people. Remember those times when God had acted on their behalf. When God had revealed himself to them. He's a God who can breathe new life into dry bones. And despite what Sam Ballot believed, God's able to bring life out of rubble. So Nehemiah reminded them of God. And then secondly, he, rem- he, he seeks to re-envision them. Reminding them of what God had called them to do. They weren't simply chipping stone. They weren't only rebuilding this physical wall around the city. They were rebuilding their community. They were rebuilding their lives. They were rebuilding a worshipping community that lived by God's word and evidenced his life to the surrounding nations. God had called them to join in and be part of this far grander vision. And Nehemiah had sight of that. He was like the third worker that our traveller encountered who had the vision of building a cathedral. In the midst of everything that was going on, all the opposition they were experiencing, they were fulfilling God's call. That makes it God's work. It's his name that's at stake. An awareness of that provided Nehemiah the confidence to say this in verse 20. Our God will fight for us. Our God will fight for us. And of course, that's what we see God doing as he frustrated the plans of their enemies. The impact of realizing that truth, God will fight for us, is transformational. As we look to God remembering his faithfulness and goodness in the past, it inspires confidence and trust in the present and renewed hope for the future. 
It's an, an encouragement to us to stand together, recognizing that we're better together and that our God is fighting for us. He's fighting for his people. He's fighting for his church because he's fighting for his name. So as we take a moment to look back, as Nehemiah has done with his people, and we remember God, what does that look like for Whangarei Central Baptist? Some of you have been here many, many years, and you've seen the hand of God at work. Others have come into this community more recently. But as you look back on the past, how has God been at work in this community? And as you remember, may that give you confidence that his hand is still upon you and you can look forward in hope for the future. We remember God at work as the church reached out to young school dropouts and the unemployed through the Regent Training Centre. We're grateful as we remember the support that this church has offered to other Northland churches that enables the work of God to continue in their local communities. We remember the ministry and support that has been provided to those struggling with their mental health through the Arataki Ministries. We remember the way that lives have been shaped through overseas mission experiences in Fiji, Thailand, Guatemala, India, China. We remember. We look back and we see God at work in the life of this community and we remember and we give thanks. And I'm sure that as we individually look back on our own lives, that we can see those times when we've experienced those thin places, when God's presence is so tangible and his leading so clear. We serve a great and awesome God, a God who is fighting for us. As we look back and remember may we also be reminded of the call of God to be his church, to know our identity as his sons and daughters, to be his people sharing in his life, experiencing his love, his mercy, his grace, his compassions that are new every morning. May we remember this ongoing experience through his spirit which shapes us to live differently so that we are making God known and visible by our life together. The church in the West needs to change to continue embracing God's call in this particular time involves letting go some of the rhythms and practices that have served our past. How we've structured community life when we were at the center of society in a place of power needs to be very different now that we've moved towards the fringes and we're often viewed as irrelevant and out of touch with reality by the society that we are called to make our God known to. And the impact of COVID-19 has only increased the awareness and impetus for that change. We need to realize that God is doing a new thing. He's renewing and reforming his church and inviting us again to join with him in his mission to make all things new in Christ. We can't pour new wine into old wineskins. It means embracing change, and that isn't easy. It means letting go some of the things that we value. It will be uncomfortable. It will be tempting to look back at what we had. It's going to require us to face opposition. 
But as we look back and we remember the faithfulness of God, we have the courage to face that opposition and change knowing that our God is fighting for us. He's fighting for his people. He's fighting for his church. As we've seen through Nehemiah, embracing God's call requires action from us. We see in verse 17 that his work on rebuilding the wall continued. People carried out that work with one hand and held a weapon with the other. This picture of carrying on God's work but continuing to be prepared for any ongoing opposition. So as we look back and remember God and we're reminded of his call to us as his church in Aotearoa, New Zealand. What does it look like to have a holistic view of life? We we're doing life and faith together. We were carrying out God's work, yet continuing to strengthen ourselves in the face of the opposition we're experiencing. With all the change we've experienced, we now have the opportunity to look at our lives and reprioritize. To make sure that we put in place those things that are important. You may have heard the story of a philosophy professor who once stood up before his class with a very large jar. And he filled the jar to the top with reasonably large rocks and asked the students if the jar was full. The students said, yes, the jar was indeed full. And the professor then added small pebbles to the jar and gave the jar a bit of a shake so that the pebbles dispersed themselves among the larger rocks. And then he asked again, is the jar full? The students again agreed that this time the jar was actually full. And the professor then poured sand into the jar to fill up any of the remaining empty space. And if the professor had started putting sand into the jar, there would have been no room to fit the rocks and the pebbles in. And it's the same with our lives. If we spend our time distracted by small and insignificant things, we'll run out of room for the things that are actually important. Those things that are contributing to the life of the church and the grander vision of God's kingdom come. So in this time when God is doing something new, when he's rebuilding his church, There's three spiritual practices that need to be considered as rocks for the church to embrace the change, to help us to overcome the opposition, to shape us as a community that are living differently today. And the first of those is practicing the presence of God. How many of you are familiar with the name Brother Lawrence? A few of you. Brother Lawrence worked in the kitchen of a monastery, developed a way of life where he was prayerfully conscious of God's presence as he went about his day-to-day activities. And such a practice involves us being more aware of God's presence with us. What is God doing in this situation that I can join in with? How can I extend his kingdom in this place, in this moment, through this conversation? It might be a simple word of encouragement to a a work colleague who looks down. Or delivering a meal to someone who is sick. As we practice the presence of God, no matter where we are, or what we're doing, we become open to experiencing God's grace. And each of us becomes a vehicle of that grace to others. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So the first practice is practicing the presence of God. The second practice is biblical hospitality. As we look back to our first lockdown in 2020, we often heard the team of five million. This team that came together as we reached out to others. Whether it was checking on the well-being of elderly neighbors, 
helping provide groceries for the vulnerable, phone calls, text messages, or Zoom calls to check up on others, or simply growing closer to those in our bubble. We saw a nation come together and demonstrate what it means to lay down our own selves for the well-being of others. And that's what's involved in biblical hospitality. It's about providing opportunities for others to encounter this space in which it's safe to be vulnerable. A space of welcome, of acceptance, of connection, a, a space of love. A space where they're invited into relationship. And it involves laying down our desires so that we are able to be present with others and offer them that precious space. How can we rearrange our diary to intentionally connect with others? Perhaps those who are different from us. Maybe someone younger. Maybe someone of a different ethnicity. May God open our eyes that we may see people in our relational networks who need us to create those spaces for them. To practicing the presence of God Biblical hospitality. And the third practice is discerning the mind of Christ in community. Something that's at the heart of what it means to be a Baptist church. One of our strengths in this time. The promise of the risen Christ present as we gather. Where two or three gather together, there I am. And the church is formed again and again as we join together with others. Whether it's in small groups of two or three or life groups or mid-sized groups or large gatherings like Sunday mornings. It's in Jesus that we have life. And as we come together in him, engaging in his word, sharing, questioning, debating, conversing. We're able to discern what the spirit is saying to us in community through our personal experiences, through our worldview, through our different ethnic origins. As we participate in times like that, we begin to discern the voice of God bringing us to unity as we share in Christ and discern his transforming word to us. So three practices. Practicing the presence of God Biblical hospitality and discerning the mind of Christ in community. Three practices that are important for the church in this new season. It may feel at times like we're just chipping stones. But as we engage in those particular practices with this grander vision of God's kingdom before us, we provide God space to speak to us and to shape our lives as his people. We provide God the opportunity to renew the life of his church. In the midst of all that's going on in our world, God is at work and renewing and rebuilding his church. He's doing a new thing. He's calling each of us to join in and be part of what he's doing, shaping us relationally that we may evidence more of him and his love for us to the world. People today are asking, where's God? People in the Whangarei area are asking that question. Where's God? And the answer to the question lies with the church. It lies with you. When the grace and love we experience from God becomes characteristic of how we live out the one another's in community. How we encourage one another, how we build one another up, how we pray for one another, how we love one another. People will be able to point and say, look at the church. Look at how they love. Look, there's God. Demonstrated by a community who love God is at work in the lives of our community, helping us all to share in that love and to thrive as his people. 
We may not see the fruit of all God is doing through us. But as we chip away at our stones, we can be confident that we're contributing to an eternal purpose that will be greater than any of us can ever imagine. That vision before us when God finally ushers in the new heaven and new earth and we'll be in his glorious presence forevermore. What a vision! It's a vision worth giving our lives to, no matter the opposition, for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we are privileged again to come into your presence and to be able to call you our Father. We are grateful for the stories as we look back in this community of you at work. And in this period of change and challenge and opposition that's going on for this church community and also for all churches in this current context. Father, we want to lay our lives before you. We want to know your ways. We want to know who we are as your people and what you're calling us to be and to do. So I pray that you would compel us by your spirit with a vision of what it means to be your people today. In the same way that you called Nehemiah. May you call each of us to see a vision of what this church community could be. As we open ourselves to you. And what you would have done. Father I pray a blessing. Upon this people. A people who have been invited to share in your life to experience your love and your grace and your mercy. And I pray as they do that, that the, the way that occurs with, in relationship with one another, that it would overflow into the local community. And people would be able to see and know you through the way this community serves one another and the way that it loves and the way it reaches out to fulfill the vision of your kingdom. So, Lord, in the midst of all that's going on, may those precious times of you being present and active in the past of this community hold it in its presence and give new hope for the future. May you renew, may you restore, may you heal in a way that makes this community become a strong witness again of your life and your goodness and your grace. We thank you that you are a good, good Father. And we pray for the renewing work that's going on. The people would respond to the work of your Spirit. And follow in obedience through all the opposition that occurs. Remembering that you are a faithful and good God. And holding that vision before us of being in your presence forevermore. We give you thanks and praise and honor. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.